Okay. All right, sixth graders. So here we go. We are in lesson nine of personal narrative. And in the previous lesson, um, you worked on flash drafts. And so now what is so important is to decide um, which of your goals you are going to really work on diligently and make it your driving force to improve in that area. And you want to have one particular goal you're working on and you can always have a side pocket goal as well. But, you know, I think it's hard to work on a lot of goals at once. So really strive to make one, one type of thing that you're working on better. And just as a review, you can use all kinds of tools. You can use your rubric. You can use your checklist. Um, always refer to the goal list that you wrote. Um, you can look back at other work or mentor texts. But regardless, I have kept a stockpile of personal narrative strategies um, from day one. And so I'm going to very quickly read through these and kind of center in on the one that fits your goal. And if you don't have that goal yet, pick something from what I'm going over that you know you most need to work on. And if that means you have to go back and relook at what you wrote yesterday and really decide what you need to work on, and I'm sure that you could get feedback from a partner that you're working with if you need help on this. Regardless, you need a goal. All right, so you can think about description. Do you have figurative language? Dialogue, which is talking. Action. Description. I mean, we should get an image, all right, when you describe something. How about small moments, all right? Think about the event that you described in your flash draft and zero in on a moment that was very important. And it's like you want to spread that moment apart so that it goes slower during that part so that you get every piece of the description, maybe dialogue, action, whatever it is that you're going to put in there to let the reader know and feel exactly what you did. All right, and that small moment could be when you're introduced to a new person or just about that person. It could be an event. It could be a place. Remember, you drew story maps to help you exactly remember everything about a place. You can use other writers' ideas, all right? And that's what mentor texts are all about. Um, you can think about the first time, the last time, and what you realized or learned. You might want to think about the point of view, who's telling it, and be in that moment with dialogue and description. Think about dividing tools, right? Um, and that can be when you do a switch in settings or possibly in who's telling um, the story, like the character point of view, um, or maybe you're just the, the narrator's telling about a different character and there's like a change in the story. Um, there could be a plot change, right? You're changing to some other event happenings. Um, think about the theme or message and repetition or using the title in the story. That's what they did with everything will be okay. All right, so that's a very great tool to use. Um, we've talked about leads, so try out a variety. Dialogue, sound effects, onomatopoeia. Action, a snapshot, if in a picture, a description, some fancy question, maybe that's layered, flashback. Um, and remember, you can stack these ideas. You could have, you could start out to grab our attention with dialogue and then move into some question, right? That's okay. Now, we haven't talked about the other two yet, so I'm not going to discuss those. All right, so those are all of the different things that you might want to think about. All right, and I want you to go back. Uh, I have an excerpt here from Everything Will Be Okay. And this would be an example of slowing down a particular moment, a small moment. Give me a second here to focus in. All right, and you can see that I even underlined this when I was reading and learning about this. Writers zoom in on the small but powerful details that really capture big moments and feelings. All right, and 
It says, do you remember how the author did that so powerfully and everything will be okay? And here we go. Smokey is inside a big old pretzel can with a hose attached. Clawing at the can sides as my brother pumps in the gas. I mean, that is so impactful and so sad is what I was thinking. All right, and then this author says, because this is an area they want to work on, they want to spread apart or slow down that intense moment, that small moment that's so powerful and include lots of details. So this person has um, a story that they're writing about. It's the story of one of the first times my friends and I had permission to go to the playground without an adult. My mother made us promise not to climb the trees at the playground. And of course, that's exactly what we did. So I'm really going to work at trying to capture the tiniest details of the moment, the ones that made a lasting mark on me in that moment. I projected a page containing part of my narrative from my writer's notebook and looked at it with the students. Don't look down. Just keep climbing. You're almost to the top, Bobby urged. I swallowed and snuck one quick look. And this person says, I picked up my pen, clearly thinking hard about how to attempt this work. And then I added, Lydia was still standing at the bottom of the tree, holding my dark blue sandals with one hand and shielding her eyes with the other as she looked up at me. The tree swayed slightly and I tightened my grasp on the trunk. A rough piece of bark dug sharply into my forearm, but I didn't dare move. I think I need help getting down, I shouted, my voice high and tight. I thought about my mother's clear warning to stay out of the trees that bordered the playground. This must be why. Hold on, Bobby called. He cried slowly around the tree, circled slowly around the tree, and then walked towards Lydia, talking to her in a low voice. I couldn't hear him over the rustle of the tree's leaves. Suddenly, he grabbed Lydia's arm and pulled her away from the tree. Run, Bobby commanded, and they made a dash for the gate. All right, so you can see how we could have just said, I decided to climb up in the tree even though mom had advised me not to. Not near as interesting as what I just read to you. All right, it went on and on. There were probably 15 sentences there just about that moment. Okay, so you, again, need to decide which piece you're going to work on. Now, I have a mentor text here by Gracie, and I'm going to read through it. It's about... Oh, page and a half. It'll take a little time. And then I'm going to go back and show you some things that you might choose to work on. I could hear the squeaking of sneakers on the polished wood gym floor as I dribbled the ball. Over here, Jamie shouted, waving her arms above her head. I made sure there was nobody in the way and passed the ball to her. Jamie dodged her brother as he ran in front of her and she caught the ball. Jamie dribbled, then passed the ball to Io. The basketball hit the gym floor and went straight into her hands. From her hands, it went straight through the hoop. Yes, I yelled. I looked over at the stands and saw my dad cheering. That smile on his face made me feel supported. It motivated me to win the game. Tidy and Jakey's team had beat us the last time, but this time I was sure we had this. We were ahead by two, and there was less than a minute remaining on the clock. All of our team's hard work was finally going to pay off. The smile on my face instantly disappeared when Tidy got the ball. He was one of the best players on their team, even though he was only eight. He dribbled the ball to the other side of the court. Io followed right behind him, trying to get the ball. I looked at the clock. There were only seven seconds left. Tidy dribbled around Io, who towered above him, and shot the ball. It bounced off the backboard and went through the hoop. A three-point shot. As I punched the air in anger, the light brown beaded bracelet that my dad had given me slipped off of my wrist and fell onto the gym floor. I quickly gathered the small round beads and the broken string, but one of the beads rolled under the bleachers before I could reach it. I put the beads and the string into the pocket of my gray shorts and walked over to Jamie. The crowd of parents in the bleachers were all on their feet, clapping for tidy. I remember feeling that huge wave of disappointment, like it was just yesterday. I gave Jamie a high five, even though I was still frowning. We tried our best, I said. I was terribly sad because we had practiced so much, all to lose by one point. 
Then I looked over at the parents. They were still on their feet cheering. I then found my dad's face. He was cheering loudest of all. There was a huge smile on his face as he chanted Tidy's name along with the rest of the parents. Tidy! Tidy! echoed through the gym. Every time I heard his name, my heart sank a little lower. I could hear my dad's voice above the other adults. Why hadn't he cheered like that for my team? That was what filled my mind. I knew that Io and Tidy's dad had left when they were young, and my dad had tried to be there for them, so I tried to calm down. I tried and tried, but I just couldn't calm myself down. I felt like my dad didn't even notice that I was there. I heard my dad's footsteps as he stepped down from the bleachers and onto the dark yellow gym floor. I saw him start to walk in my direction, so that began to make me feel better. I remember thinking everything was going to be okay. My dad was going to make me feel better. I was used to my parents being very supportive of me and making me feel better when I was sad. It then turned out that the complete opposite of what I thought would happen. My dad didn't even notice. Oh, sorry, I lost my place. My dad didn't even look at me as he walked straight past me and right up to tidy. I felt as if my heart had dropped from my chest. Great job, buddy! My dad exclaimed, seeming to forget that I was even there. I was standing right next to them, and yet it was as if I was invisible. My dad gave Tidy a high five and continued to praise him as I stood there alone. I walked directly in front of my dad to see if he would notice me, but he did not even look up. I didn't understand why my dad couldn't even acknowledge me. I was his daughter after all. Tidy wasn't even related to us. I wish my mom would have come to our game instead of him. He was going too far, and I could feel the anger burning inside of me. I wasn't used to my dad acting like this. My dad still had still not stopped chattering about Tidy. It was just one shot, but my dad seemed to be explaining the plot of an action movie. I took a deep breath and started to walk over to him. I tried to push the lump in my throat down as I made my way up to him. Dad, I'm really sad that we didn't win, I said, desperately seeking his support. The huge smile stayed on his face. His light brown eyes were full of light. Did you see that that shot Tidy made, he said? It was amazing. It was as if he hadn't even heard what I just said. I could feel the anger bubbling up inside of me. I just wanted to scream at the top of my lungs. Now, being older and thinking about this, I know I shouldn't have been so jealous, but I was used to my parents paying more attention to other children than to me. My, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I thought I made a mistake. My dad really did hurt me that day, and I still think about it now. I am more mature now and than when I was 10, but if this happened again, I still think that I would feel pretty horrible. I then walked over and stood by the wall, trying hard not to cry. I slammed my fist on the beige wall. I had thought my dad cared about me. I know that he does now, but at that time, it sure seemed like he didn't. I was trying so hard to hold my tears down. I swallowed. Thoughts of sadness and hatred ran through my mind. This just wasn't right. Fathers were supposed to care about their own children more than other people's children. I looked up to see Jamie's dad patting her on the back, and that was the breaking point. I felt tears start to stream down my face. I was crying in the corner. My dad didn't even notice. Io then noticed that I was crying. Are you okay, she asked, leaning down to talk to me as her short brown hair fell over her eyes. Yeah, I said, trying to stop my tears, but I wasn't okay. I wasn't okay at all. I was sure that my dad had completely forgotten that I existed. At that point, I just couldn't hold it in anymore, and I could feel sobs rising in my throat. I looked over my shoulder to see my dad standing with Tidy, and more anger joined my sobs. I kicked the basketball on the floor as hard as I could and charged down the stairs toward the bathroom. I turned to my right and ran into the girls' room. I held a brown paper towel to my face as I sobbed into it. To this day, I still think about every moment of that day. That moment made me stronger and helped me grow up a little bit. It made me more mature than I was before, and it helped me realize that even though I am an only child, my parents won't always be thinking about me. All right, now here was the point of this read aloud. I wanted to show you how a mentor text can be so great for getting ideas. So this is just another thing to do. We kind of used a mentor text from the teacher book, um, and we used everything will be okay. 
um, showing you about an important small moment and then the small moment of climbing in the tree without permission from that author. Now we're talking about the story The Unexpected Brother by Gracie. And these are the things that Gracie did well. All right, she remembered to end in her paragraphs. And some of these seem really like small things, but if you're not doing these things, any of these things might be your goal that you're going to master and work on. Action, all right, picture, an image, the way the lead in is for this personal narrative. It has got action and imagery layered as a way to engage us, the reader. We have the use of a dash. Remember I said a dash is a great way to emphasize an important point. All right, in this case, a three-point shot. And remember a dash is two hyphens together when you're typing. Okay? Um, symbolism. Gracie uses a lot of symbolism with color. The light brown beaded bracelet. All right, that her dad had given her. Brown can represent family and relationship, and it falls apart. The bracelet falls to the floor and breaks apart. Symbolism at its best. All right, the gray shorts. All right, all these different colors that she uses, and they're intentional. Um, the social aspect, all right. I knew Io and Tidy's dad had left when they were young. We get this um, social relationship, and, and my dad had tried to be there for them, so I tried to calm down. All right, and the internal thinking, what she's thinking at that point. Sorry, I forgot to move this up. Um, about how she's trying to talk herself out of being upset. All right, so that's important. And you might be able to weave um, some social discussion and internally what you're thinking during that time, right? The internal thoughts. Um, lots of dialogue, lots of talking. And um, she's talking to her dad, dad, I'm really sad that we didn't win. All right. And then you know that this is someone else talking, all right? The huge smile stayed on his face. Oh, I'm sorry, that's still the same paragraph. Did you see that shot Tidy made? He said, it was amazing. Oh, I see. All right. This is um, her talking. She's talking to dad. Um, and then this is dad. So new paragraph. Every time a different person speaks, then you remember you have to change paragraph. But we have the dialogue, the talking, right? We have an incident where we go back to a flashback to this day, all right? So this is later on when she's writing this. To this day, I still think about every moment of that day. That moment made me stronger and helped me grow up a little bit. So now we're getting into the theme. This happens a lot at the end. All right. The author will tie it all together um, in the ending and give you an idea or reason the purpose this was written to begin with, which hints at the theme. They don't always directly tell you, but um, oftentimes it's hinted at. All right. And it could be that this theme is growing up is hard. All right. So. You can see there are lots of ideas to take from a mentor text. So again, all right, um, the point of this lesson is that it's important to realize that you must work steadfastly towards your goals. And you can practice this in your notebook. It's not that you have to rewrite your entire story every time. Pick a piece that you want to make better and practice that in your notebook. And that's what I want you to work on today in your practice. Think about your goal, really pick that one goal that you're going to work on and practice it in your notebook. And then you can incorporate it into your narrative when you get ready to write the final one. All right, that's the work for today. Signing off. Oh, oh no.